morning is Sophie Morel uh, from Harvard University, and she's going to tell us why our intersection cohomology is useless. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I'm not going to apologize for the content of my talk because the expressions, uh, Galois representations, and automorphic forms are going to appear at least once each. But I feel like maybe I should apologize for the title because a few weeks ago when they asked us, they sent us speakers an email asking us for a title and an abstract. And I very naively assumed the abstract would be posted along with the title. So, so I, wrote, <laughs> I wrote the title as a stupid joke and then I wrote an abstract that explained what the talk was actually going to be about and the abstract was never posted. <laughs> it was just an exercise in abstract writing. So now all you had was the title, which was never meant to be very serious. So let me explain the title. Well, a few years ago, I uh, became aware of the fact that non compact Shimura varieties are useless if you're just trying to construct Galois representations because they contain the same Galois representations as compact Shimura varieties, at least up to some base change. And I meant the title exactly in the same way that intersection cohomology is useless because it contains the same Galois representations as cohomology with compact support. And so that's the first thing I want to explain. Like so I will start with uh, stating a theorem. <coughs> oh no, actually I will start with introducing some notation. So if G is a, a group over Q, reductive algebraic group connected, then um, I'm going to call xg its symmetric space. <coughs> so the space of maximal compact subgroups uh, of G of R. And I'm going to be interested of quotients, so locally symmetric varieties. This xg divided by gamma, where gamma is an arithmetic group. And if uh, V is a representation, so algebraic representation of G, say over Q, but it could be over any number field, then I use it to define a locally constant sheaf on this X gamma. Uh, sorry, on this gamma divided by X of G just by saying that um, gamma acts on V. So that action of gamma on V div divides me a sheaf using this quotient. X of G goes to gamma under X of G. And actually the, and in the cases I'm most interested in is if this gamma of X of G is a Shimura variety. Um, <coughs> this thing has an Eladic version, so I'm going to use the same notation, which is horrible for the Eladic version and the uh, topological version. And now let me specialize. Uh, so I could be talking about uh, more or less an Ishimura variety, I guess, but I'm going to make my life simpler. I'm going to lo just look at Ziegel moduli varieties. So now G is GSP2G with a certain integer G greater than or equal to zero. And I'm going to, and I fix an integer three, um, N, at least three, and I'm going to look at MGN is just a moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties with n level structure and for now it's over q and this is the Uh, 
this is also a Shimura variety for G, or rather a canonical model of a Shimura variety for G. So if I look at the points over C, it will look like a finite disjoint unions of spaces like that. So I'm going to have a use this uh, sheaves FV defined on it. So, so let me fix V then. I can look at the cohomology of this FV. And now that I'm, <coughs> OK, now I'm considering algebraic varieties over Q. So this FV became elliptic. And this thing has an action of the absolute Galois group of Q. OK, so here's our Galois representation. Uh, often I'm just going to write this H star of mg and V. Just to uh, shorten the notation. And uh, this is, uh, so if you believe my title, this is the part that I'm going to assert is useful. And the useless part is intersection cohomology. But actually, what I really meant is that this one is useless, and the intersection cohomology is useful. <laughs> 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 but I, I like, what can I say? OK. So if the Shimura variety were compact, that would be the end of the story as far as cohomology series are concerned. But this one, the Ziegler modular variety is non-compact unless g equals 0, then it's a point. And so there are other choices. So let me introduce one of them. So this thing being non-compact, it has a few compactifications. The Several will appear in this talk, but the first one that will appear is the minimal compactification that I will call MGN bar. So also known as Bell liberal compactification, Satake Bell liberal compactification, minimal Satake compactification, and probably other names that I'm not aware of. It's this nice uh, normal, very singular variety in general. And the intersection complex this coefficients in V, I will call ICV, is what is called the intermediate extension of FV. So here, uh, you will notice I am cheating because actually I should, uh, sorry, I should shift it so that it's a purpose shift, and then I should shift it again so that it's concentrated in degree less than or equal to zero. But I'm going to pretend this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in this case. And it's uh, so this guy, I will have uh, more opportunities to talk about it, but it's called an intermediate extension because it somehow sits between the extension by zero and the uh, usual um, right derived extension, uh, or the right derived usual extension. So, and but what happens is. This one is dual to that one, and this one in the middle is self-dual. And I should say at this point, yes. Uh, well, maybe after I introduce the next thing. So the intersection cohomology is going to be, by definition, the cohomology, or if you want, hypercohomology of this, this thing. The reason I say hypercohomology is because this thing is not a sheaf. In general, it's a complex of sheaves, or rather, an elliptic complex. It is not really a complex. OK. So intersection cohomology, uh, first introduced, as far as I know, by Goreski and McPherson. McPherson is not here to see me destroy it. Uh, then the sheaf <laughs> <laughs> shift theoretic interpretation, I think. Uh, well, if you believe Goreski and McPherson's article was suggested by Delin, uh, I, I believe Goreski and McPherson's article. And then there was this systematic account of it in this uh, book by Bellinson, Bernstein, and Delin, with Gaber as a phantom false author, <laughs> and then many other works about it. So that's OK. Um, so I think, oh, right, and I need 
to explain another thing because before I can state the theorem, I need to talk about the, the structure of the boundary of this compactification. So the reason I chose Eagle modular varieties is that the boundary, there won't be any uh, annoying technical problems when defining the boundary like quotients of Shimura varieties by finite groups and things like that. In this case, the boundary is just going to be uh, this joint union of an old G prime between 0 and G minus 1 of a finite joint union of strata of the form M G prime N. And this is uh, these joint union size sets, of course. They are locally closed subvarieties. And the so the closure of such a stratum in this big space is its very liberal compactification and all that. So it has this nice hereditary property. And uh, if you know about Satake compactification, you know this thing should be associated to um, maximal parabolic subgroups of G. So in that case, well, this MG prime N is a Shimura variety for the group GSP to G prime which is a factor of GSP to G prime times GL of 2G minus 2G prime. And this thing, it's a Levy subgroup. Sorry. I see it as the subgroup of G of uh, block diagonal matrices size here G to G prime G then it's a maximal levy. So associated to some maximal parabolic subgroup. And the theorem is in uh, well, first let me uh, state it in a stupid way. So in the Grotteny group, of uh, representations of Galois of Q bar over Q. Right. Uh, okay, so I didn't say it, but of course, as the cohomology of a complex on this, this uh, thing over Q, uh, then this cohomology also inherit uh, an action of the Galois group because the complex is defined over Q. So if I look at the class of this and I subtract the class of the cohomology with compact support, then what's left is going to be a sum over G prime smaller than G, some class of the cohomology with compact support of M G prime N with coefficients in some V G prime. And this here is a uh, virtual algebraic representation of GSP to G prime. That means they can be signs in there. So basically, uh, this intersection cohomology is just the, com the same as the compact support cohomology modulo things that are just compact support cohomologies of smaller Shimura varieties. Um, okay. Well, and actually, that's not very precise. Actually, um, you really have the, in the growth and the group of complexes on the very liberal compactification, the intersection complex minus the um, extension by zero is a similar sum. <coughs> this time over all G prime and then over all strata isomorphic to M G prime N of uh, the class of the extension by zero of some local system on the stratum associated to some um, well, virtual algebraic representation. Um, okay. And 
here they are not the same because here I put together all the strata that correspond to given G prime, and here they are separated, of course. Um, well, um, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, on G. Yeah. I mean, yes. What? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I say, okay, just a few a few remarks about this. For the, the the first question is why do we care about intersection cohomology at all? Uh, so this is where I pronounce. Yeah, this is where I talk about automorphic forms. Okay. One reason to care about intersection cohomology is uh, the so-called Zucker's conjecture that says <coughs> that. It's going to be the same as L2 cohomology of the Shimura variety. Uh, it's not a conjecture. It was proved by Luyenga and Rappaport. And then, no, first Luyenga, I think, then Luyenga, Rappaport, Saber Stern. Anyway, and so uh, the L2 cohomology of the Shimura variety has a very direct relationship with discrete automorphic forms on the group G. Um, by Matsushima's formula or Borel Castleman theorem in the non compact case. So this was automorphic forms. That's the last time I mentioned them. Uh, and another nice thing about intersection cohomology is that it's, uh, so it's this cohomology theory that is uh, defined, well, the most useful, uh, the place where it's the most useful is uh, singular varieties because for non-singular varieties it's just the same as ordinary cohomology. And it's supposed to mimic the properties of the cohomology of proper smooth varieties on proper non-smooth varieties. So for example, it satisfies Poincaré duality, it satisfies purity. So it's the case cohomology group is pure, that means it's going to be easy to separate the different degrees. And if you try to do this with cohomology with compact support, then it's going to be very hard. And the big drawback of intersection cohomology is it's really hard to calculate. Uh, Yes, hence uh, theorems like this. Um, so another remark, yeah. Maybe it's a pedantic, that's a pedantic question. That WM is in various degrees, isn't it? Uh, well, uh, here I'm talking about classes in the Grotony group, so it's in various signs, yes. Right. But it's in various, but yeah. So the, the remark, yeah, I'm going to tell you, actually the theorem, as I stated, it is pretty stupid. And I think you probably don't need all this machinery that I'm going to, that I'm introducing to prove it. Um, in fact, you have a more precise result. First, this equality in the Grotendieck group comes from uh, a commutative diagram of exact triangles. Uh, so the commutative diagram is going to look something like this. Here is intersection cohomology. Here is the extension by zero. Here are, there are some things. You don't know what they are. And here there are some more things and some more. And when I have a line like this with a plus one here, it means exact triangle and some <coughs> triangulated category. And here do you have things that I'm going to call squares. Square, square, square. And the square the square is some f of w for this uh, complex of representations. <laughs> but actually, The commutative diagram is a cube, a hypercube dimension G. So here I just, this is the case G equals 2. And when you calculate classes in the Grothendi group, then you know uh, this lower square, and you can get the class of the intersection complex from this. And these commutative diagrams are all uh, canonical. So for example, you have actions of the Hecker operators on them, too. And the second remark is uh, this uh, WM. Uh, uh, yes, thanks. <laughs> 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 uh, 
uh, I stated the theorem is totally useless. Actually, the WM are explicit. There are formulas for them. I just didn't want to write them because just <coughs> lots of notations. But when I will explain how to prove this, this theorem, then you will see how to get the formulas. Uh, yeah. And the first thing I should say is that uh, this is Okay, so actually this result over C has been known for a while. It comes from an article of Goreski, Harder, and McPherson that I'm going to talk about a lot right now. This result over a finite field has also been known for a while. Uh, comes from the work of some unimportant person. And uh, the only new thing is that uh, this is also true over Q. And why it's easier over a finite field than over Q, I hope to be able to tell at the, the end of the talk. But for when, when you say that WM are explicit, it means that they do not depend on uh, the level in particular? Uh, yeah, uh, to independent of only, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. They depend on V, they depend on G and G prime, but uh, sure. Sorry, I didn't think of mentioning that. OK, so um, before I start to talk about calculating the intersection complex, I want to well first write down more explicitly what the intersection complex actually is. Um, I mean, let me erase this. So what is this thing? It's not that mysterious. There is a very nice formula for it due to the lean. And uh, to, to write the formula, I need to explain this truncation functors. So this is truncation by degree. We will have three types of truncation in this talk. And this is the first one. So what is this truncation functor? If I have a complex, a complex of things, say a complex of sheaves, it, it could be abelian groups, which are just particular sheaves, of course. And uh, actually, uh, in, uh, in the cases I'm going to consider, which is elliptic sheaves over a variety over Q, this is not really a complex of sheaves. It's, more, it's a very complicated construction, but we like to pretend they are complexes of sheaves. So just <laughs> let's, let's pretend. <laughs> Uh, so if I have a complex, this is just going to give me, oh, sorry, you can't see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. This operation gives me another complex with a map to the original one. And it's going to, what it does is it kills the cohomology in degree uh, greater than A, so <coughs> such that the HK of this guy <coughs> isomorphic to HK of the original complex if K is at most A and is equal to 0 if K is greater than A. OK, so this is truncation by the cohomological degree. Uh, this is, when I write HK, it's a sheaf cohomology. It's not the cohomology of any space. So now the formula is actually a bit confusing to calculate the exact degrees of truncation because everybody has different conventions. <laughs> um, but so let me introduce, OK, let me introduce some notation first. Mg prime will be the union uh, of all strata isomorphic to this Mg prime n in the minimal compatification. So that's a disjoint union. They don't intersect, of course. And uh, then this, if I take this union MGN, MGN is the same as MG, MG minus 1, etc. union MG prime. 
and then I add mg prime minus 1. So I'm going to add the strata by decreasing dimension. This I call j of g prime. This is for g prime between 1 and g. And uh, inclusion j of the open part in the convectification is just j1 composed with j2, etc., <coughs> composed with jg. And the theorem says this ICV, you can get it by uh, well, taking this FV on the open part and then applying the first and adding the strata of highest dimension, that is applying this RJ, JG lower star, then truncated, truncating by something that I'm going to call CG minus 1. OK, I'm going to give it away. Uh, oops, let, let's make sure. I, I think it's CG prime equals co-dimension of MG prime minus 1 is the correct formula. So I, yeah, I extend, I truncate by the degree, I extend again, I tr and, and until I arrive here. So the operation is extend, truncate, extend, truncate, extend, truncate. And this is going to work because all the shifts I have are uh, constructible with respect to this stratification. And uh, yeah, so as I said, really, yeah. let me give an example. I, uh, let me give two examples, actually. So first example is g equals 1. That's the case of modular curves. So in the case of modular curves, here is a modular curve. M1n, and the convectification is adding points. So uh, let's pretend there's, I will always pretend there's just one stratum of each type just to make my pictures easier to draw. Actually, I add a finite number of points. And over that, uh, I have the sheaf. Here is Fv. Okay, and when I take, uh, the j lower star at over this point, I'm going to have things appearing in two degrees, so degree 0 and degree 1. And the formula tells me that I should just get rid of the thing in degree 1. So in that case, ICV is just the ordinary jg, <coughs> jg, or j in that case, lower star of Fv. That is, I don't take the derived thing. I just take the degree 0 part. So that formula works great. Now let's look at g equals 2. So g equals 2 is the case of a Ziegel modular threefold. Um, okay. So a threefold, that means it's dimension 3. So here's the thing, uh, m2n, dimension 3. And that's complex, that's a dimension as algebraic variety, so real dimension 6. And um, then at infinity, I have some modular curves, so dimension 1, and I have some points that are just m0 ends. Uh, OK, so now, well, let's look at the sheaves. So over the open part, I start with this f of v. And then first, I forget about the points and extend just to the modular curves. So I get things in two degrees again, degree 0, degree 1. And I have to cut out this part in degree 1. So let's see. So the formula in that case, by the way, it's just going to look like this. Uh, it's J1. And 
And right now, I, I have calculated this part. It's the same calculation as for g equals 1. So this is just g2 lower star. Uh, wait a second. Uh, there is, what, what did I say? I'm sorry. There are more degrees. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, I won't. Um, I don't need that. 3 minus 1. Four. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so the co-dimension is going to be something else, like one, and it's going to be whatever because we won't be able to calculate it anyway. <laughs> but uh, oh, sorry, but anyway, calculating this is not too hard. What you have is if you calculate this, then it's just a. Uh, usual rj lower star and then the remaining part so the the part that you want to cut is going to be something like this so it's just going to be some fw on the strata for some complex um, some maybe representation in several degrees but okay now the problem is uh, you apply this this other function, but that's not a problem for now. So this is a a functor that respects the triangulated structure, it respects the exact triangle. But now, if you want to apply the second truncation operator, you want to apply it to this guy here, and it's not so easy because this truncation operator. You want to truncate by cohomology degree, so you have to know uh, this thing in each degree, and the exact triangle is just going to give you a long exact sequence of cohomology sheaves, and it's not clear if the maps are injective, subjective, none of the above, what the images are, what the kernels are, and all that. So, uh, well, actually, I, I once did a calculation for constant coefficients on U22, but it's not easy. I didn't know how to generalize to more to non-constant coefficients. And uh, well, I know several people have tried to calculate it that way and failed. So what do you do? And this is where weighted cohomology comes in. So so coming back to the intersection complex, there are some cases where the intersection complex is easy to calculate, uh, as I told you or not. Okay, if, for example, I have a smooth variety and I embed it into some proper variety that also happens to be smooth, okay? Then this intermediate extension, say of the constant shift on u, is just going to be the constant shift on x. So in that case, intersection cohomology is ordinary cohomology and you don't have, well, you're supposed to know how to calculate that. At least in this talk. Now, one question I think that appeared in the beginning of intersection cohomology was: Oh, you have this this cohomology theory. It behaves like the cohomology of a proper smooth thing. So, question: Is it possible? Well, I have this MGN and I have this horrible compactification that is not smooth, does there exist a resolution of singularities, mg and tilde? That is, contains this mgn also as an open set, uh, such that the intersection complex, say with constant coefficients, is just rp. Uh, the pi lower star of the constant shift. Okay, so the 
the answer is no. Or at least, let me tell you. So you can ask this question in general, and the answer is in general, intersection cohomology is not the cohomology of some smooth proper variety. For Shimura varieties, I said no, probably, because nobody has found such a thing, but nobody has proved such a thing doesn't exist. So <laughs> it's just not very uh, encouraging. But, uh, but there is something you can do. Uh, which port am I going to use? Not sure. Is it this one? Okay, forget for a moment you are dealing with algebraic varieties and let's go to C points. So. So I say, for algebraic varieties, I don't know if such a thing is possible. But if I look at the C points of my varieties, so these are complex analytic varieties, if you want, then there is something which I'm going to call MGMC tilde. I notice the tilde is over everything, because this is not an algebraic variety. And this is not the C points of anything. Uh, there is something that is like a partial resolution of singularities. Uh, and there exists, so there exists such a diagram, and there exists a truncation <coughs> in a certain sense of this Rj tilde lower star Fv. So here, um, let's call it Wv, whose image is the intersection complex. Uh, okay, so the board is too small for to write the names of these things. So let's see, this uh, mg and c tilde is called the reductive Borel self compactification of this thing. It exists for any locally symmetric variety, in particular for a Shimura variety. It's not algebraic at all. It's just a topological space, it's not, not even a, an analytic variety. It's a, what is called a sub-analytic sub space. It's nice enough. And this is actually first constructed by Zucker. And this guy is called weighted cohomology complex. And constructed by Gureski, <laughs> Harder, and McPherson. Uh, part of a whole family of uh, truncations, but the one that would interest us is the middle, the middle one that projects to intersection cohomology, uh, into the intersection complex. Sorry. And uh, again, as I, I switch to topological spaces now, these FVs are complexes of sheaves on topological spaces and not eladic anymore. And this guy, this this thing is not an eladic sheaf because it's not even living on an algebraic variety. Okay, so yes, this uh, reductive Borel ser. What do I want to say about it? I just want to say something about its boundary. So I said the boundary of the minimal compactification has a stratification by uh, strata that correspond to maximal Levy subgroups of the um, symplectic group. And here, there is a similar stratification, but it corresponds to Levy subgroups, not maximal anymore. And for each, OK, modulo conjugacy. For each conjugacy class of Levy subgroup, there is a finite number of strata that are of the form 
xm divided by gamma m, where this xm is the local symmetric space of the Levy subgroup, and gamma m is some arithmetic group. And uh, it's not smooth by any, in any sense of the word, but it has a very nice property uh, that's, I mean, there are many ways to say that these singularities are not too bad, so I'm going to tell you the way I understand. I don't know if it will make sense to you. But if I look at, at one stratum and this thing, okay, and I look at its, uh, its closure, which, by the way, is its reductive Borelsa compactification. And if I look at, I look at this RG tilde, lower star of FV, and I restrict to the closure of the stratum, then that is the same as restricting to the stratum itself and then extending, it, extending again. So it has this, it has this very nice property that I can calculate the restriction to the closure of a stratum just by knowing what happens to the stratum. And this is something that uh, this property, for example, is true uh, for the toroidal compactifications, so for anything that has, whose boundary is a uh, divisor with normal crossing. And so that's one reason that you can see this guy looks, looks a little like a nice smooth compactification with nice boundary. And it's going to appear again, this property. So now intersection. Ooh, my, my picture is there. Cool. Um, okay. So now, weighted, what is weighted cohomology? How do you define this complex? So I will just show you. Uh, can I, can I yes. So what, what is J and what is J tilde? Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Over there. The, the <coughs> inclusions. Ah, sorry, it's J tilde in both cases. So J tilde is the inclusion of the Shimura variety in the, this reductive Borel cell compactification. And J is the inclusion in the minimal compactification. And, okay. I want to explain how you construct this weighted cohomology complex in the case where g equals 2. If, if you understand g equals 2, you understand g in general, uh, normally. <laughs> so let's assume g equals 2. And let's look first at the spaces. So I'm going. Uh, yeah, I have to erase part of this work of art, actually, most of it. <laughs> so now I'm looking at complex points, and this is a, a space with real dimension 6. And I will look at the, the compactification. So I have um, this time not two boundary strata, but three boundary strata. I will have, I don't remember the colors I use. So I have this one, this M1 N of C, so dimension 2. This is just my, my modular curve. It, it corresponds to this Levy subgroup. Uh, how did I number them? Uh, the modular curve is M1. The Levy subgroups have names, but I never, I never know their names. So it's this Levy subgroup, the one to one. And this, this is a nice algebraic stratum. And then you have another stratum here that corresponds to the Levy M2, which is this two, two block. And technically, in this case, it's 
diffeomorphic to a modular curve, but we don't want to think about that. Because this Levy is just GL2. Uh, it's generally deeply non-algebraic in nature, but it's dimension two. And then you have uh, the point um, here corresponds to the <coughs> minimal Levy um, M1, 2. So you're, you're allowed to think of the point as a point, uh, algebraic if you want. <coughs> OK, so that's the spaces. And if you project to the minimal compactification, then you have the same M2 zero, uh, M2n of C here, and you have the same M1, M1C here, and you have the same point here, but uh, all this guy here is all sent to the point. Right. So all this is sent to just one point there. So, yeah, okay. Now the shifts, <coughs> let me take Q coefficients here. So on the open part, I have this F of Q, which is just Q. Then I have um, here, if I extend to here, I have some cohomology degrees. And this guy is going to come from the representation of this Levy M1 on the Lie algebra, the cohomology of the Lie algebra of N1, where N1 is the unipotent radical of the parabolic corresponding to the Levy. So here is N1. So normally, I think 1, 2, 3. No, three degrees. Well, and uh, the other one here, same, comes from the action of M two on this cohomology of N two, where N two is this one, and the last one on the point you will have even more cohomology degrees appearing and this corresponds to the cohomology of the unipotent radical of the Borel. So what are you going to do? Uh, the idea of weighted cohomology is instead of truncated by the degrees, I'm going to truncate by the weights of some tori acting on these parts. So the tori that are acting, uh, they are central tori in the Levy. So here I have the torus S1 acting, S1. This central torus in uh, M1. Uh, here I have a torus S2 acting. S2 is this, just this lambda, lambda, 1, 1. So central in M2. And on this part, I have S, I have both of them. Is this. They are both central in M12. M12 is just a torus. And what you're going to do is you're going to, uh, I need maybe another color, uh, on each stratum, throw away some of this, some part of this complex. Here, for example, I'm going to throw away Kurt, the part where this uh, S, uh, S1 acts by lambda goes to lambda to the k for lambda uh, for k smaller than a certain thing. Or the certain thing, I think, is something like minus co-dimension. So oh, colors? sure. You can't read. <laughs> So, so you cut the part 
where this S1, uh, this as a representation of S1 is just a sum of characters, and you cut the part where the characters are lambda goes to lambda to the k, with k smaller than something. I think the something is the co-dimension of the stratum. What you cut? Cut. Cut away this part. Uh, uh, and you can put plus one here. It won't change the final result once you project to baby boy. And on this other part, uh, same thing. So you're going to cut. Cut part where S2 acts by lambda goes to lambda to the k, and k is smaller than something. The something I've always given by codim mostly is co-dimension of the strata or stratum or minus co-dimension. Sometimes there is a plus one. And here, finally here, you're going to cut. <laughs> Whoa, it's become complicated. You cut part <coughs> where S1, S2 act by some characters. Uh, is the same cutoffs as here and here, but you consider the two actions. Uh, sure. And uh, what's left? What here is left? Here, so it's not, so you don't always throw away some degrees and keep others. You can keep part of one degree here, for example. What here is left is what is called the weighted complex, weighted cohomology complex. And the theorem of Goreski, Harder, and McPherson is its image on the Belliborel compactification here is the intersection complex. Okay, so it looks nice. Uh, I totally lied to you, actually. It's not as simple as it looks, because <laughs> uh, when I say cut here, I mean, it's very nice. You have this uh, RJ tilde lower star of Q. You restrict it to one stratum. It's just a nice sum of its sheaves, of its cohomology sheaves. All the cohomology sheaves are locally constant, and it's very easy to define truncations. But of course, you have to glue everything to get a global complex on the space. And that is not so easy. So what they actually have to do is to, to find some explicit complex, and not just an object in a derived category, but an explicit complex representing this RG tilde lower star. And with some actions of this tori uh, on the strata, or maybe in the neighborhood of the strata, and then define this truncation by hand, and it's actually technically quite hard. Uh, I think they, they, do, they do it two different ways, and they, they have to show the two different ways agree. And one of them uses differential forms, but I'm not very familiar with the construction anymore. But anyway, so it's not that this is the idea. The actual realization of the idea is not that easy. Uh, and this also. This is going to give you the theorem uh, without the Galois actions, because you uh, looked at C points, so you you're not on the Q anymore. You lost all the Galois actions, so that's that's too bad. <laughs> Shall we say? So what? How do you recover the Galois actions? <coughs> So the question, how can you make this construction algebraic? Uh, so right now it doesn't look very good because uh, the space on which it, the, this, this thing lives is not even an algebraic variety. But let's look at what we can do. Okay, I will need I will need a piece of notation. I will need notation for the inclusions. So the inclusion of so now I'm back in the minimal compactification, the inclusion of this stratum uh, the M1N I call I1, and the inclusion of the zero dimensional stratum, the M0N I call I2. And why uh, 
it, the, the number is the same as the one for the levies over there. Okay, so let's forget let's forget about this truncations for now. So the idea is we are going to have to send everything to the minimal compactification anyway. So what happens if I, if I look at the different parts and send them one by one on the minimal compactification? So the, on the open part, there's nothing happening. I still have the, my FQ. And then on the yellow part here, the modular curve, there's also nothing happening. This is just an isomorphism. So I will have I will have the same local system only maybe if you want an algebraic version you can make it eladic and so this is the same as the restriction of this thing to FQ. But now on the point so at the point here there will be the, there will be a lot of different things happening. Well, there will be this this red part will be sent to the point, and this red part. Well, if you if you remember that formula, you use it to calculate the r pi lower star. Then actually, you can see that this is just going to be the restriction of my r j lower star to the point. And I'm probably going to run out of room for the purple part. <laughs> the purple part is more, the purple part is the most complicated. And I mean, if you're not careful, you're just going to smash the red and the purple parts together and you're going to lose whatever you were doing up there. So you shouldn't do that. If you, but if you look at that formula again, you can convince yourself that the purple part is just taking this RJ lower star restricting to the, the bigger stratum here, extending again, and restricting to the smaller stratum. OK, uh, now uh, the, OK, so what's the general philosophy? I said there would be three truncations, truncation in this talk. The first was truncation by degree. The second was truncation by tori weights. And the third is going to be truncation by Frobenius weights. So the general idea is, uh, if I look, for example, at this central torus S in G, and I look at how it acts on V, then this is going to give me the weight of this sheaf FV as Frobenius weights or as Hodge weights. Uh, depending on how you want to look at this sheaf, let's say for minus weights, as defined by the lean. And I can, I can apply the same result on this strata. These strata are just smaller Shimura varieties. So what's going to happen is here the weights of S1, and sorry, the action of S1 is going to translate to for minus weights on this strata M1. And the action of S2 here is also going to translate as Frobenius weight. But here I have two actions. Here I have S1 and I have S2. So since I'm running out of time, I'll just say it in words, as people say. Although if you write on the blackboards, it's, it's worth two, actually. But anyway. So the action of S2 here is going to tell you about the Frobenius weights when you see this as a sheaf on that point. But the action of S1 is going to tell you about the Frobenius weights that would appear here when you look at this part on the modular curve before you extend and truncate again. So now you can make sense of all the truncations by the actions of tori, because this will be a, here you will have a truncation by weights. And here you will have a truncation by weights. And here you will have, say, truncate this by weights 
then extend it again, restrict it again, and truncate by weights and all the time. And this is great, except uh, now same problem. Uh, this is all on the strata, but how do you glue everything together? So now what's, what is going to help us glue everything together is you, what you need is a series of weights for not for just these locally constant sheaves, but for more general complexes. And you need a theory of truncations for more general complexes. And this is exactly what Dulin did in his proof of the Bell conjectures, define weights of complexes, of elliptic complexes, and prove a lot of compatibility theorems and prove the existence of a weight truncation on, say, uh, locally constant sheaves or more generally perverse sheaves. So, Okay, no protest. So this works. No protest. Uh, actually, what he did that over for varieties over finite fields, which is the reason I told you the Silliman theorem was already known over finite fields because you can apply the Lin theory of weights. Um, so let me just tell you what happens when you're over Q. So when you're over Q, you can define weights in the same way by extending to a model over some open of Z and restricting to the finite field. And you have to make care that your sheaves and morphisms of sheaves also extend. So that's done in an article of Annette Huber. But the, the weight truncation will not exist because the weight truncation depends on some calculations in Galois cohomology. And the, Galois, the cohomology of the Galois group of Q is much bigger than the cohomology of the Galois group of a finite field. And the weight truncation simply, it just simply does not exist. There's nothing you can do if you define weights in the usual way. Uh, and so the answer, uh, what you can do is you use this Bailey-Solins point of view that perverse sheaves are better than ordinary sheaves. And that the, your category DBC of XQL is just the derived category of perverse sheaves. And you force the ways to exist by saying, OK, I'm going to do all my calculations in the derived category of perverse sheaves that admit a weight filtration. And you have to construct the seven operations on these but this is all explained. I mean, the way to do this, it's all explained in Bernison and in Mohiko Saito's articles. And it's just an exercise to see that it will work in this case. And then you can apply the general formalism and make this work. And that is like the last minute was the new content <laughs> 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 of the talk. Thank you.